my education uh, in this industry came from uh, sleeping in the back of a Dodge van, going from racetrack to racetrack with my trusty toolbox. Uh, you know, our fam my family was in manufacturing. Uh, we manufactured fire door hardware in, in Philadelphia. Uh, we lived actually out in the suburbs, uh, not too far from Valley Forge. Uh, but you know, my dad, my dad, uh, my dad, his sister, his brother-in-law were in the business. And before that, my grandfather, grandfather was in the business. So we'd always been in manufacturing, but I was the only car person. Uh, nobody else, of course. You know, my one of my grandfathers claims he was a mechanic, but my mother says he's blowing smoke. So, but that, that's uh, that's pretty much as far as it goes. Yeah, I'm the only car guy, and like I say, I learned everything on my own. I mean, completely self-taught. When I was a youngster in high school, uh, I kind of got started by changing the spark plugs on the family st station wagon, uh, and then I kept dinking with cars. I mean, my grandfather bought me a, a Ford Falcon that didn't run. It needed an oil pump, so I figured out how to put an oil pump in, and then I just get working on it, and then I start working other cars. Uh, after school, I worked uh, at one point for a sports car dealership uh, that had Sunbeam and MG and a bunch of others, uh, and I got all the crappy jobs. And uh, you know that was, you know, I just really liked sports cars, and then I also had a job at Fritz Ohls. Uh, doing parts and running cars, which has always been around cars. And then I went off to college uh, for all the wrong reasons uh, and kept kept working on cars. I mean, I just uh, couldn't stop, you know, get away from working on cars because they're just, they're just so intuitive to me and logical. Uh, I mean, I just, I, I figure things out pretty easily. And then uh, at one point I decided to, uh, See, I was in college in Denison, Iowa. Then we moved to Omaha, and I went to IU, uh, not IU, uh, University of Nebraska, Omaha for a while. But I kept working on cars, and I just, you know, I got really bored with college. Um, I was having a hard time holding my interest because it's so boring. And then uh, just, you know, I was working at, I think, a Fiat dealership in sales. And a couple other, you know, like foreign cars. So, you know, going back to what really kind of put me forward is, uh, I can't remember the year, maybe 67, I think, uh, or 66 maybe. Uh, I, uh, me and my buddies were at Watkins Glen, uh, and I get got to see my boyhood hero, Jimmy Clark, win the uh, U.S. Grand Prix. And uh, Jim, Jimmy Clark was Scottish, and I'm Scottish, so uh, he was like my all-time hero and then you know being in a formula one race when you're in high school uh you know the sights the sounds the smells i mean it was just intoxicating and i just you know from that point on i wanted to be in racing but it kind of took me a while to get into it so i just started, started my own sports car shop and uh it was that was called mini sport and it you know grew all the way up into the early 80s uh and it was it was the shop where uh People would go when they couldn't. Somebody else couldn't figure out what was wrong, or somebody else screwed up their cars. Uh, I was uh, it was like the the uh, uh, ranked the best in Omaha for a foreign car repair three years in a row, which was pretty good, I thought. Uh, and then that uh, you know I worked on all kinds of stuff, a lot of British sports cars, MGs, Triumphs, uh, in fact, all through the years of those cars, uh, a lot of Fiats. Uh, and uh, let's see, oh, also uh, back then it was Datsun. We did, uh, I did a bunch of 240Zs where we'd, we'd kind of, we'd put like three side draft Weber's on them and headers and uh, it just, you know, we really woke them up. So, I mean, it's, I've always been, uh, you know, just into, into sports cars. Now when I had my shop, I was, did my, my own racing. I got my first regional and national corner workers license uh, and then, you know, one winter, the opportunity came along to uh, somebody was selling a, a Formula V at, at pretty reasonable price. So, you know, I bought a Formula V and started racing. I think my first race was at, uh, the track's not there anymore. It's MAR Mid-America Raceway, which is on the, just west of St. Louis. It was a gorgeous track. I mean, it was, it had, it had everything. It had a big straightaway. It had hills, it had trees. 
big elevation changes. Uh, so that was my first. And then for the most part, I did uh, in Midwest, we live in Omaha, the Midwest series was tracks like Hutchison, Kansas, uh, uh, Lake, Lake something in, in, in near Wichita. Uh, we went over up to Brainerd. We went to uh, Blackhawk uh, and uh, MAR quite a bit. There's a couple of the Lake Garnett. Uh, the Garnett, and there was another temporary track. I can't remember. It's been too long. Uh, and then I, I did some, uh, I had uh, another guy who had, a, I, he, he got a Formula Ford, so I did all the work on the Formula Ford, and, I, and then I drove that a few times too. And then just I started working on other people's cars. You know, the, uh, we did uh, an interesting thing is uh, Dwayne, a friend of mine who was actually a police officer, bought a Formula Atlantic, uh, a really nice Rolf RT1, and we looked after that and I mean, he was just, he just, just gentle racer. He just, you know, wanted to go out there and drive. And uh, uh, it's, uh, I think at Hallett one year, we were at Hallett and Dorsey Schroeder was there. And you know, a lot of people know Dorsey Schroeder from, not only from racing, but from commentating. And uh, there was another, it was a young Japanese guy that had a brand new, really expensive Formula Atlantic car. Uh, that he had, he got like big money behind him. He's just gone track to track to track all around the country. And him and Dorsey were racing pretty close because Dorsey had been national championship in Atlantic like multiple times. And uh, so Dwayne uh, qualified third, you know, right behind them. But it's kind of cool the way it worked out on, on one day, uh, Dorsey's on the first day, uh, first race on Saturday, uh, Dorsey's car overheated. Uh, and the, uh, the, the Japanese guy had a kind of like a spin or something. And, you know, Dwayne ended up winning the race. Didn't even know he won the race till we told him. And then for the, for the, the, the second race on Sunday, uh, you know, Dorsey was on the pole and the, they, and the, and the Japanese kid, they take off and, and Dorsey, you know, went really wide on one corner and drove off the track. And, you know, the Japanese kid drove off right behind him. And then just went, Dwayne went sailing by and he won that race. So the kind of weird stories. I mean, you, you don't have to be the fastest car to win races. But then I started looking after other people's cars. Uh, it, it seemed like when I went racing, it cost me money. And when I worked on other people's cars and made their cars competitive, I made money. So, you know, e economics sort of dictated the direction from there on out. But I, I still would race when I can. But you know, like I say, it, it was it was more profitable to uh, work on other people's cars and put them on track. And that, that one of my customers actually won the regional championship. I can't remember what year in Formula V. Uh, he was he was pretty happy with that. And then uh, I guess in the uh, mid early mid '80s, uh, I got really bored with it, and that was a point in time where uh, interest rates were like. Over the, over the moon, I mean, like 20% interest rates at the bank. And cars were changing and I was gonna have to get some new equipment. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't imagine, you know, borrowing a whole bunch of money at really high interest rates for this new equipment. And I was really getting bored with them. I really loved the racing, uh, but I was getting bored with, you know, the whole street car business. So I just, uh, I just, you know, kind of, you know, all my bills were paid. And uh, I just decided to, to take some time off. So a friend of mine uh, sort of borrowed the name and he set up, set up shop somewhere else. And then I just started doing like some freelance stuff. And then, uh, uh, I can't remember what year it was. Uh, I went to uh, up to Road America and was the, uh, worked for the Skip Barber Driving School. And uh, during, during the week, uh, I was the shop foreman. Uh, that kept uh, all the all the cars running. Uh, they're all Formula V's. And then on about every other weekend, there was the uh, Barber Racing Series, Midwest Racing Series. And at that point, I was a crew chief, and uh, I managed uh, a bunch of uh, part-time people, and I think 12 or 12 or 14 cars. Uh, so that that was a lot of fun. After. Uh, after Skip Barber, Skip Barber was based obviously at Road America. And there was, at that time, there was the Midwest Pro Series for Sports 2000s. 
and Sports 2000s are a little, they look like a, you know, a small uh, open cockpit prototype car. And they ran the, uh, the uh, Ford two liter overhead cam motor. Uh, and they had, a, they had a pro series. So it went, went between Road America and Mid Ohio. Uh, and they, they were kind of a support race for all the big races. And uh, so uh, the March people from the UK, uh, DB Motorsports, they based their cars at, the, at uh, Road America for Andy Blank, who was a big uh, Budweiser distributor down in Florida somewhere. So we had, we had the two cars there, so I would help. They only had one mechanic. So, you know, af after work and on weekends, I would help him, you know, maintain the cars and stuff. And uh, we get, you know, that pro program kind of grew. Uh, and uh, <laughs> interesting, and, and that was exciting. I mean, Andy, Andy Blank ended up finishing. He had a, he had a couple of lap records and he ended up finishing second in the pro series two years in a row. So, I mean, the cars were pretty good but he decided he wanted to try big time racing. So he put a deal together for uh, a prototype in IMSA back then. And it was actually a Spice. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Spice brought a car over and then they put the program together. And, and, and Dave, my partner in the DB Motorsports uh, was you know, contracted to work on that team. So uh, I kind of went, went along with that, uh, went along with them doing uh, little stuff. And uh, what Andy, who Andy had for uh, uh, co-drivers were uh, Michael Andretti and John Andretti. So that was kind of cool, but kind of different. I mean, it was, it was a rude awakening for, for Andy. Just like I said, the, the AE guys going into pro motorsports. Uh, I mean, Andy would do his stint and he'd get out of the car and he'd be sweating and he'd look just completely beat. Uh, you know, John Andretti would do his stint. He'd get, get out of the car and he'd look fresh as a daisy. So there's a big difference between club racing and pro racing. But yeah, I, I was uh, after that, uh, after uh, Barber, uh, and then the year after that, we actually won the SEC runoffs in Sports 2000, won that championship. And then we got a customer from Chicago that said he had, he was a great driver, had uh, great engines and a lot of money. Uh, push came to shove and none of that was true. Uh, None of those, not even a one came true. So he ran out of money pretty quick and he crashed the car twice. So, uh, but anyway, I was the US, US point, contact point for uh, Martin Sports 2000's uh, service center parts. Uh, I did that for a couple of years. And then we, what we, it was, it was a really, really good lesson in uh, the business of motorsports. We had the, the March cars that we had were by far the, the best car. They're superior to all the other cars racing. Uh, I mean, they were narrower. They had less, less uh, frontal area. Uh, the suspension was designed by the guys at March, who at that time were building uh, sports cars, Indy cars, and Formula One cars. In fact, some of the same pieces on this March Sport 2000 came off by like their Formula Two cars. And so it was a great car. It was a really great car. But uh, the other two major brands, Tyga and Lola, uh, had far better were far better financed, had better marketing. I mean, Lola was was handled by them by Carl Haas, which was like, you know, God in the uh, in, uh, in motorsports. And uh, you know, we had the best car, but we didn't have as good a marketing. Uh, so I mean, it just on the business side, we just were having a hard time, you know, uh, getting customers, uh, even though the customers that had the cars loved them. So that was that was just just a lesson that. Again, not having the best product doesn't always guarantee market success. So, yeah, that was that was fun. I really I really enjoyed that. I mean, those are cool cars. And then uh, after that, I went back to we were living in Omaha. At the time I went back to Omaha and was still bored. Uh, and then somebody somebody came to me that said, "You need to talk to these guys. They're building uh, McLaren replicas. Uh, they were building replicas of the McLaren coupes." And uh, they needed somebody, they had some cars go on, they needed somebody that could finish the cars. So I went to work for them for a while, but when I got there and saw the cars, I mean, they were a mess. Uh, whoever did the original engineering just had no clue in, in how to make a car work. I mean, e everything was wrong. Uh, and, you know, the only way to really fix it was to start over and they didn't even, they didn't have the money to do that. I mean, it was so wrong that they had one car out that they had uh, somebody want to contest on, but the, the brakes were just, they didn't work. 
And you know, when I finally I, I got it in and started looking at it, and they had it backwards. They had the the uh, master cylinder. They had the the rear brakes hooked to the front and the front brakes hooked to the back, and it just the car would wouldn't stop. So I got that. That was pretty easy fix, and then uh, and then use the, uh, the bias adjuster to get the get the balance right. So, but I mean, it was just you know it, I, I couldn't see it going anywhere because I mean it was going to be too hard to make the cars really work good. So then I, uh, uh, another friend of mine, uh, who's a doctor, uh, were, was importing these tube frame cars from the UK called the Cougar with a K. And essentially they came over and it was like, it was, it was a big tubular sports car with a center body and like the, the bicycle fender over the tires. And what it was is they shipped the, the uh, chassis over, but to complete it, you had to uh, t get a, a Jaguar and take the Jaguar part and use all the Jaguar running gear, rear suspension, front suspension, engine transmission, uh, was all Jaguar or Jaguar, as they say. And, uh, and I, I did that, I built him a couple cars, but for him, it was, it was just a hobby. I mean, he really, you know, he, he, he liked the scene the, the, it turn into a business, but you know, he didn't have the, the wherewithal or, or the money to put into marketing. So that's kind of just, you know, I was doing that just, just for him and working on a couple of the cars at his place. And then uh, he was out in California for a, uh, for some sort of conference and he had an extra day out there. So he had, he was uh, partnerships in a Ford dealership at the time with his, I think his brother-in-law and they went uh, and he was out there and he'd seen an article in one of the magazines about this guy, uh, uh, Celine that was building Mustangs. So he stopped by to see him. And when he did, he found out that Celine had just gotten his cars homologated for the SCCA Pro Racing Endurance Series. It was called the Escort Series back then. And he wanted to go racing and didn't really, was kind of a, didn't know what to do or where to go next. So you know, Dan and I put a little money into it uh, to build the first car. And because it was, um, we did the deal like the the uh, Long Beach Grand Prix and the first race was less than a month away. So we actually uh, built the car at Fred's shop up in Sacramento because the, the first race was uh, Sears Point, uh, which is you know not too far from Sacramento. So we kind of threw that car together and uh, it was, you know, the first race was really from, from our end, really kind of a cluster, uh, everybody running around in circles, but nevertheless, I mean, the car did pretty well. Uh, did well enough that uh, Steve got a little more money on General Tire was the major sponsor. Steve got a little more money on General Tire. And after we did uh, Sears Point and then Portland, and then we shipped uh, after Port, we did really well at Port Portland. That's, that's when we did a lot better at Portland than we did at Sears Point. And then uh, Steve got some more money to do uh, build another car. And so we shipped the first car back to Omaha where my shop is. And then we, Got another new car, and we we turned that into the second race car, and then we you know pretty much did the season. I knew I knew at that point I knew nothing about uh, sedan racing. You know, it's a, to, to me that real race cars didn't have doors uh, because I'd always worked on open wheel cars, formula cars, uh, prototype cars, you know, like real race cars, and uh, so it was, it was a big learning experience for me uh, going to endurance racing, which I'd never really done before. Uh, and you know, racing a, um, a Mustang with General Tires against Porsche on Goodyear tires was uh, a kind of an uphill uphill challenge. But you know, I, I figure things out. So what I did, we always tried to get close to the the best team uh, that year in in our class, the GT class, with the Porsches. So I always got we tried to get close to them, not only in the pits in the in the paddock, but in the pits. And I just, I just watched everything they did, you know, I just kind of, you know, if, if, if you want to do something better, learn from the people that are the best. So we kind of like paid attention to them. And, uh, and in August of 86, we ended up winning the 24 hours of Canada with our backup car because the primary car got crashed out about four o'clock in the morning, I think. And the second car was running, I can't remember, either, either third or fourth. And it, it was, it was pretty wounded. Uh, it had a, uh, Desiree in, uh, in either practice or qualifying had uh, kind of gotten into the, the turn one wall and we didn't know it at the time but it uh, cracked the fuel tank and it 
uh, undid the little little pocket in there that the fuel pump sits in and broke that loose. So the fuel pump was moving back and forth. So we can only get maybe an hour, no, not an hour, about uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes tops. So we should be getting 45 to 50 minutes, which meant just a whole bunch more pit stops. And when you're when you're doing a pit stop, you're not making laps. And if you're not making laps, you know, that's, that's the whole thing in endurance racing. So you don't want to be in the pit, you want to be on the track. So we just, through strategy, I mean, the, the car was, was, was hurt, but through some, uh, I would call some skillful strategy, we brought it from, uh, from third up to, up to first and uh, won the race with it, which was, uh, uh, I thought a pretty major accomplishment, especially since the car, you know, was in such bad shape. Uh, but the one thing in that race that I think clinched the win is in, in the middle of the night, uh, the the team that was uh, down track next to us down track um, in the in the pits were boy, absolutely rank novice amateurs. I mean, it was it was it was it was almost comical watching them, you know, try to do their pit stops, and they had one driver that had that was just completely overwhelmed with a red mist, and you know he he was on on the pit wall ready to go, and he jumps into his car, and hooks up his seat belts, turns it on, and drives off with the gas pump, the gas thing still hooked on, so he pulled the entire fuel cell fuel rig into pit lane. And I was under, Desiree was in, uh, the, the, we were doing a pit stop with Desiree at that point, and I was actually under the back of the car adjusting the brakes. Uh, the 86 cars had drum brakes. You know, you know, racing with drum brakes was not very exciting. So about every, I can't remember what it was, uh, maybe two or three pit stops, I'd have to slide into the back of the car with my little tool and adjust the brakes. I had it all set up so I could do it pretty fast. And I was under there and I saw what happened. I just screamed, get her out of here. And I rolled out from under the car just as it came down. She kind of just barely went through the puddle of gas, which is all over pit lane. And she got out and just the second she was across that, that gas, uh, they closed, closed the pits or closed pit lane. So nobody could, nobody could make pit stops. Everybody just had to you know, run around under a yellow flag. So if I hadn't gotten her out then, we'd have been stuck there uh, for, it was a good, I'm going to say 20 minutes or so uh, before they got all that gas cleaned up. Uh, and that would have really put us down. So that was kind of a good call, I thought. Uh, but that, yeah, that was, uh, you know, the, tw the 24 hours of Canada in GT classes is no small feat. But most, most of the races in, in, the, in the SECA Pro Series were long. Uh, the shortest race were six hours. And any time we do a six-hour race, I mean, I just, I, I, I couldn't believe it was over. Uh, you know, when you're really geared up for, for 12 hour and 24 hour races, a little six hour race is like nothing. In fact, you didn't even get to do much strategy, you just had to run like hell. And so what we, what we did, I mean, we, we came away pretty good in 86. I think we were, ended up being second in the championship. I can't remember. In 86, I was really tight with the, uh, oh, the engineers in the Ford X garage where they do all the R&D work. And they, the, that group was Mustang, T-Bird, and Mark seven maybe mark eight uh and uh, i got to know a lot of them and uh you know we were working pretty close on parts and, and developing the cars and uh, this, this one guy mike jones was uh in their suspension uh, part and you know we got talking and we started talking about how the mustangs didn't want to turn very well uh i mean the, you know they, they they didn't turn well and the back of the car got loose uh so we uh we, I was talking with Mike and he started running some scenarios in geometry, uh, front suspension geometry. And, you know, we, we talk about, you know, moving this point, that point. Uh, and we, you know, we really couldn't do a lot, uh, but other than talk about it because it was supposed to be quote production racing. Uh, so what happened is we went into 87. I mean, we, we really had had some, some, a much better front suspension geometry figured out, uh, but again, if you start you know, whacking on holes, you can't you can't move any any of the points, uh, suspension points. You start whacking on holes, and the tech guys are going to notice it right away. So one day I get this phone call that uh, there's some parts for me out at the airport, you know, one of the the air freight places. So I go out there, and here's like a, you know a, a a small plane, and sitting on the ground are three 
brand new K members out of the factory with no holes in them whatsoever. They're totally virgin K members. So packed them up and took them back to the shop and I sent everybody home early. And you know, knowing what I knew, what we've worked at with Mike, uh, I spent all night putting holes in 3K members. And when people came in in the morning, uh, there was 3K members on the, on the bench, all painted, and they looked just like they came out of the factory. Uh, but every single hole had been moved uh, to improve the geometry. Uh, so that, that, w that was kind of cool. And then that, that's kind of like started my AGS Advanced Geometry Suspension Systems. That was like AGS you know, 1.0. Uh, but uh, going into 87, we never stopped through the winter. Uh, we kept working on things. And there was, a, there was a bunch of stuff on the 86 cars that, you know, I made a whole list of things for Steve from an engineering standpoint need to be changed uh, for 87. You know, one of the things was strut tire brace. In uh, 86 at Road Atlanta, we showed up with a three point strut tire brace on both cars because we really needed to, you know, get the settle down the front end um, so we wouldn't get as much chassis twist and we get better handling. And the SCCA came up and said, well, you can run it for this race, but don't bring it back because that's not part of the production cars. So, <coughs> needless to say, in 87, we built uh, three-point strut tire braces for the Celine production cars so we could run them on the race cars. And then the other thing that we did was jacking rails where we, you know, put, had, had tubing across the pinch weld. So, because we were doing a lot of pit stops, I mean, you need to be able to get the car up really fast. So, with, with the jacking rails, it was really easy to get the car up. Plus, we could put jack stands under there, which was, was pretty clever. But SCCA comes out, no, no, that, that, that has an additional chassis stiffening device. So we actually had to take hacksaw and cut these little, little just little tiny grooves uh, in two different spots to break it into thirds so that it was not considered, the, uh, the tube did not get, was considered as running the entire length. Uh, in 87, that didn't say a thing, it didn't bother us. So you know, what the difference was, I don't know. But uh, uh, in 87, we, we built the strut tire braces and all the Celine Mustangs. And we worked through the winter. And, uh, you know, we were, we worked really hard through the winter. And we, we did as the first race was going to be at Sears Point. Uh, and then what Steve did is he talked General Tire into, this was maybe two weeks, four weeks ahead, into renting uh, Sears Point for a weekend so we could, uh, uh, do some testing and they, they, what, what he sold General Tire on is they could use that to get a lot of filming done. They, they, you know, they could, because they always had a film crew, so they, they could do uh, filming at, uh, uh, at Sears Point without all the other cars there. But that, what that did, that gave us an, a, a chance to do two days of testing uh, and really get the cars figured out and sorted. And we just, you know, we came race time, you know, we showed up and we, we, we won uh, one Sears point and we got to Portland, we won Portland. Uh, and then uh, I think the next race was Brainerd maybe. And uh, the problem was, is, is after, you know, two, two long races, and the cars needed, needed to be, you know, kind of fixed up a little bit. And, you know, I put a list in to Steve on uh, what we're going to do and, and what, how much it was going to take. And we got only got a fraction. He only sent about a fraction of the money it was going to take to get the cars really ready to go again. So, you know, we patched them back together and went to Brainerd and, uh, and we did lousy. Uh, you know, we had problems with the cars and it just didn't go well. And afterwards, Steve came up to me and said, well, what went wrong? And I said, what went wrong is we didn't have any good parts. So after that, we, we got, we got better on, uh, on our allocation for, uh, uh, first for maintaining the cars never really what i wanted but but better enough to make the cars go and then we kind of just uh, i will say dominated we dominated the first part of the series series but then as the season moves on everybody starts getting better and better so I mean, if you can win the first couple of races out of the box you're going to get ahead ahead of everybody as they catch up so we just you know, drove and drove and drove the, the daylights out of the cars. And our, we had, uh, you know, a couple of cool things. We ended up building three cars. And uh, the third, the first car was Steve and Rick. The second car was uh, Desiree and Lisa. And then the third car would always be guest drivers. Uh, and uh, uh, at Mid-Ohio, 
middle had Sebring. I can't remember the other one. We had uh, Pernelli Jones and George Fulmer in the third car, which was a hoot. I've got some really good uh, uh, stories about those guys. They're definitely, they're definitely cut out of a different piece of cloth when it comes to rain, racing. So, no, we, we ran the cars hard and, you know, Porsche caught up and it was getting nip and tuck. And we got down to the last race of the season, which was a 12 hour race at Sebring, which is just like any other Sebring race. It starts in the afternoon and it goes into the night. And uh, we had a problem with uh, Steve's car, the lead car. Uh, and that race was driven by Steve, Rick, and uh, uh, Scott Pruitt. In fact, Scott also drove for us at most sport in 87. So we had the, the rear end went out. And uh, so we ended up having to change, swap out the entire rear end at night in the dark, in the rain. Uh, and we lost, I think, 15, 20 minutes. So, you know, we were behind and we had, by that time we had three of the championships wrapped up. And I can't remember what the fourth one was, that we, but we needed to win the, uh, we needed to get enough points ahead of Porsche to win the, the final championship to make a clean sweep. But having that car in the pits uh, for so long really put us behind. And it got down to the last, in the last hour of the race. I mean, Steve was just, man, he was just a nervous wreck. Because, uh, you know, we really were working hard to get that car up. And it got down to the last, last little bit. Uh, and Parnelli Jones was in the third car. And he either turned the radio off uh, or it broke, or guessing he turned it off because he just likes to drive. And we kept putting pit signs out and he didn't know what we needed to do. He, we needed to stop that car so that the other car could get, make enough laps to get ahead of it. And by doing that, then the, we'd win the fourth championship. So he wouldn't answer the radio. We had pit signs out. So, I mean, this is getting like right down to the very end. So we went to the SCCA and we said, we think there's a mechanical problem that could be dangerous. Can you black flag them? <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. So yeah, they black flag him. It took like three laps for him to see the black flag, but he finally came in and it was like really close to the end. So what we did is we sent somebody all the way down to the beginning of pit lane and stopped them there. So he did not cross the, the start finish line. So that lap didn't count. And we really got lucky in the, uh, in the, in the final minutes. Uh, the, the Porsche in the, uh, the upper class that was, you know, the main class. Uh, the Corvette crossed the start finish line something like 15, 20 seconds before the six hours. So I had to make an entire another lap. So by having to make an entire another lap, that was one lap we needed to get ahead of the other car and won all four championships. So that was, you know, it, it, it was, it was, I, I could do lots of stories on that season, but I mean, it was, uh, you know, Steve and I were kind of at odds the whole year, but early on, I knew that I could see that the, there was pieces in place to win a championship and winning championships is not easy. It's really hard. So I stuck it out and, you know, we kind of stuck it out together but at the end of the season. I mean, I told him initially that I'd try to win him a championship in three years and uh, we ended up doing four championships in two years. So it's kind of like, okay, job done. Uh, and I just, uh, I was, I was tired. I was broke between, uh, April and October, uh, October 31st was the last race Halloween. Uh, I only had one day off and our days, our typical days were 14 hours. Uh, so I was beat. I mean, I was literally beat. In fact, at Sebring, I was so sick uh, from exhaustion and everything else that, uh, I had to go to the, the, one of the emergency rooms in uh, Sebring and, uh, you know, the doctor gave me a huge, huge shot of uh, antibiotics in my butt uh, and then some other pills uh, so I could make it through the race the next day, which I did. In fact, if we ever find the videos, my voice is so squeaky, you can hardly understand me. But yeah, and at that point, you know, uh, Steve and I, you know, went our, our separate ways. And he moved this operation up to Detroit. And uh, you know, I was looking around for another racing deal, but you know, it, it's what I discovered, you know, what Steve taught me is there's a much bigger market in the performance aftermarket. So you know, shortly after the, I think maybe October, November, somebody turns up at my door with a Mustang and says, hey, can you, can you fix my Mustang like those? Well, yeah, that's pretty easy. You know, we've been doing a lot. Uh, you know, we probably had between the two years, maybe close to 100,000 miles of, of racing and testing in the Mustangs. So yeah, 
pretty much knew what to do. So he showed up and another week somebody else showed up and then the Mustang just started showing up. So that's when we decided to sort of shift from a racing program to a performance street market because it was just so much bigger. Uh, and <laughs> I, got, I got a lot more sleep doing that way. Uh, yeah, so one thing led to another and we ended up being uh, you know, one of the, the leaders in uh, Mustang parts from there on out. I mean, the number of parts that we were first in the market with, the list is really extensive. Uh, axle brackets, everybody has axle brackets these days. So we brought axle brackets out, I think 90, 91, 92 maybe. Uh, you know, three point strut tower braces, we did in 86 and then in 87. Uh, jacking rails, we were first with jacking rails. And because the, uh, you know, the, the Fox was so flimsy, we came up with a double cross subframe connector. Uh, which has been copied. Everything we do has been copied. The only thing that hasn't been copied on our chassis system is the matrix brace. And I'm not really sure why nobody's copied it. I mean, because it just works so well. It, you know, triangulate puts four triangulations per side into the middle of the, of the Mustang, which is like a frame. Uh, but, you know, that's okay. I mean, just the, the list of things that we were first to market with is extensive. Uh, a panner bar on the back of a, a Fox. Uh, we. We use the panner bar not to center the axle because the, uh, the axles are uh, double splayed, which are self-centering. Uh, but I use the panner bar to lower the roll center from it. If you do the math, the roll center on the Fox cars is like almost up to the trunk, which is way too high. That's why the back of the cars are so loose all the time. Uh, so we use the, the panner bar we mounted at the bottom of the differential to defeat the factory roll center and introduce a new roll center. Uh, at the bottom of the diff, because where the panner bar crosses the center line of the car is, is, the, is the roll center. And that made a huge difference. So, I mean, you know, we, that, we were first to market in that. And I have to sit down and go, this is a long list of things. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's kind of how we got into the Mustang market. And then we moved from Omaha to uh, Indianapolis in 94. Uh, you know, Omaha, Nebraska is a, is a great, great city to raise kids, a uh, great place to live. Uh, you know, for a Midwest town, uh, but, it, you know, we thought for uh, a fledgling sports car business, it was not the place. So we moved to Indianapolis, and uh, we ended up with uh, a, a small space on Gaslin Alley, uh, which is just south of the Speedway, and then uh, things went really well, and we moved into a, a bigger space. In fact, we had one of the bigger spaces on Gaslin Alley, uh, and then, you know, kept going, and uh, get building cars. I think there's oh, something like f uh, around 500 serialized Kenny Brown cars out there. Uh, and it's not just Mustangs. Uh, we did, we've done uh, Camaros, uh, Explorers, Expeditions, Durangos, uh, uh, Crown Vicks. You know, we had a big Crown Vic business and Marauders. Uh, we supercharged Crown Vicks and Marauders. We were all the first people to do that too. So anyway, I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of like a really, really, really short version of uh, what I did. And then and since and then I had some health issues, so we decided to take some time off. And people, I mean, we kept getting, e Kara kept getting emails. People wanted my parts. So we kind of started getting back to it a little bit of time. And, uh, you know, we got the parts business going again. Uh, and then, uh, you know, one thing leads to another. And here we are uh, back in Indianapolis. We did a short stint in Chicago. Uh, with a company that we leased, uh, uh, leased our products and brand to that really didn't work out. Uh, so we moved back to Indy uh, where we got grandkids, plus we got a, knew a lot of people in Indy. And then also after then, of course, in, in 2011, uh, my late son, Paul, won the uh, Pirelli GT TTS championship. In fact, he didn't win it. He totally dominated. Uh, the interesting thing was that that Ford was coming out with the Boss 302S. And they, you know, Paul wanted to start the 11th season with the first race and um, Ford could not provide a car in time. So we built our own. You know, he was in California. I was in, in uh, I was in Chicago at the time. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the phone and he built that car. In fact, there's a, there was a video out there somewhere and he, he built the race car in 30 days, but it took an immense amount of work and a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of coached him through the 2011 season. I mean, he, he just, man, he, he kicked everybody's butt. 
Uh, he won five races, which tied Parnelli Jones' single season win record in the Boss Mustang. Uh, he he uh, led more laps than all the other competitors combined. Uh, so, like I say, he didn't he didn't win. He just dominated that series, uh, and he was he ran most of the last bunch of races with uh, rewards weight, maximum re rewards weight. Re rewards weight is if you win a race, they add I don't know some weight, and if you if you have eight weight added and you finish like beyond fifth or something, then they'll take weight out. So it's kind of like they put it in there to kind of help balance the competition. Well, you know, Paul was running with maximum rewards weight, which is 230 pounds. Adding 230 pounds to a race car is just huge. Uh, and, but it, you know, it didn't slow him down. Uh, to give you an idea, we, uh, the, he had the champ, all he had to do was start the second to last race. Uh, I think it may have been in Laguna, I can't remember. Uh, all he had to do was start the second to last race, and he won won the won the championships, all championships, driver team and manufacturers. Uh, so, but you know, uh, you, he you can't hold him down. But with, with 230 extra pounds, it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to qualify well. So he had, he was qualified, you know, well I can't remember where back maybe seventh or eighth back there, and uh, uh, he's so good, he drove all the way through the field. And he caught up to the guy that was leading the race. And on the straightaway, he, ran, he, he bumped into him and waved just to let him know he was there. And he didn't really need to pass him. He just had to prove a point. So, and then he, uh, the, I mean, he, that championship was done. Like I say, and he, I don't know if anybody's had such a dominant performance in, in SCCA Pro, Pro Motorsports. So but then, of course, everyone knows he got cancer and passed away the next year. So and after, after that, I, I was really reluctant to do any racing. Uh, I, did, I, did, I did what I was doing. I did some short little uh, consulting things. I helped uh, a team uh, it, uh, always evolving racing. They had three OSS Mustangs, and they were doing like NASA racing, and they wanted to, they wanted to go pro racing. So I helped them get into pro racing. That was actually Paul Walker's team uh, at the time. And I helped them get into racing, uh, help them get the car, get the cars changed over and, and kind of let them by the hand through the first couple of races, which is a very eye-opening experience for them. Uh, you know, people don't realize, you know, they do like NASA or these club racing and they jump into pro racing and they have no idea uh, the extent of the leap. And I think they were actually blown away on uh, how different it was, but you know that's what that's what my job was is to you know kind of shepherd them through. So I got them going, and then uh, and then I had another team that I got going. Oh, the uh, DP Racing. Uh, Steve Burns wanted to race a uh, Mustang uh, EcoBoost in the t in the uh, TC class, but uh, Ford would not allow it. They said, "Well, we we can't support that. We don't have any parts." Uh, you know, we, and they would, we would have done it ourselves, except Ford refused to homologate the car. Uh, so we couldn't do that. They want, wants to run a V6. So, uh, we they built the V6 and uh, I helped them get through the first, I think three, maybe three, three, four races. Uh, I, you know, uh, engineering console thing to get them going. And Steve actually ended up doing really well. I mean, he really surprised me how well he ended up. So, and then after that, I, I just do, you know, uh, aside from, you know, my normal business, I do, you know, consulting here and there with, with racing stuff and other things. I, uh, you know, suspension, all, all the, you know, working on cars, suspension geometry, everything, I've, you know, I've, I've learned myself. And that's what kind of really differentiates me from a lot of people out there is I actually made my living out of my toolbox up until the early 90s. And then we had to, you know, we had the, the business kind of grew and I had to pay more attention on the, you know, the managerial side. But uh, I mean, I, I still, you know, puts around, I still got my same old toolbox I've had for, for over 40 years. Uh, I use it just about every day. Uh, that's what kind of really separates me out because I, you know, I know the, I, I know cars. I mean, I, I, I know what every nut and bolt does. And uh, I think that gives me a big advantage. And when it comes to engineering parts or you know building cars, I mean, uh, the, the cars I build, I mean, I, I don't think anybody builds a better car than I do. 
Uh, but you, know, you look at the background I have and how many cars I've built over the years, the experience I had to pour into that. Uh, like I say, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of almost one of a kind in the aftermarket. 